Hello, we're going to talk to you today about enzymes, but in order to get that going I want to start off with a nice piece of cake. There it is, pretty good it looks too. What's in it? Well it's got some protein, it's probably got a bit of fat, and it will certainly have some carbohydrates, and there are two kinds that it's likely to have. It's going to have some sugar, and it's going to have some starch. And I want to think about the starch specifically right now. Let's take a big bite out of that cake. Thank you very much, Bob. This is Bob here on the drawing. Very splendid work. Excellent. Crumbs as well. All right, well, when we took a bite out of it, there was a big blob of starch in there. Uh, now, the trouble is that that starch is far too big to cross over the barrier into a cell. There's a cell with some nice little microvilli on it to increase its surface area. How's it going to get in? Well, there's no way in. It's far too big to get across. So what we're going to do instead to this starch is we will actually break it down into a whole load of mini particles. There they are. And those will fit across the microvilli much, much more easily. And in fact, there they go, right across the cell membrane, and we've made it, they're inside the cell. That, that's really how we want the food to be. What we've done is we've gone through some absorption. We've taken material into a cell so that it can grow and develop. And there it is, the materials are now inside the cell. Well, in order to do that, what we need to do is take the starch and break it down into the sugars that it's made out of. Big blob of starch, little tiny round sugars. Much, much better, much easier to move into cells. The starch is insoluble and big, can't travel in the blood either. The sugars are soluble, and oh, well done, Bob, you missed off small. Soluble and small. And there's digestion, that's what it is. Digestion is turning big, insoluble things into small, soluble ones. How do we do it? Well, we need to use enzymes, which are special catalytic chemicals. Um, we say catalyze, that means to speed up a chemical reaction. Here's some starch again. And you can see there the starch is made out of sugar rings. Better just label those up. And they're all joined together by little bonds. If we snapped the bonds, we would have the sugar back. We can go from starch to sugar, or we could go back the other way. Now, this is an enzyme. This is one of these catalytic things that's going to be a biological catalyst. They're made out of protein, and they're a particular shape. If you look carefully, you can see how it's going to fit onto the starch. That's right, just there. That's called the active site. And that's the part of the enzyme which is actually going to do the job. And there it goes. It's already on its way. It's going to go in, split the bond with some water, and now we've got two bits. Do it again. Split the bond, and now we've got three, four, oh, lots of bits. It's not really starch any longer. It's now maltose sugar. Maltose is the kind of sugar you find in beer. Bob really can't get sugar on the board there, can he? Right, OK, so he's going to rub all of that lot off. Maybe leave a maltose lying around. And what we could do is we could write a little chemical equation. Here's some starch back. And we're going to turn it into maltose sugar. What we say is that starch is the substrate of the enzyme. Maltose, come on Bob, label it, thank you, is what we call the product. So enzymes have substrates and products, and they do all of their work using their active site, which is what we say complementary to the shape of the substrate. In other words, it fits on, but complementary is a word I'd really like you to learn, because it's a good one for exams. Right, some sort of table coming up here. What would be good to know? How about all of the enzymes and their substrates? So we'll have enzyme, we have substrate, and we might as well put on products as well. Right, the one we were just looking at was an enzyme called amylase. Breaks down starch, that's the substrate, makes maltose. Easy, we knew that one already. Here's another important one. Protease, attacks protein, turns it into peptides little chains of amino acids. Peptidase attacks the peptides and breaks them down into their amino acids. So you can see those two enzymes as partners in one step going from protein to amino acid. And then finally there's lipase, attacks fats or lipids as we sometimes call them, makes two things, fatty acids and glycerol. And I again really want you to learn every single thing you can see on this table. Oh look at that, all enzymes end in ASE. That's how we know that they're an enzyme. That's quite handy to know. Right, see if you can learn that. Obviously, it would have been better if Bob had left it on the screen for you, but you can write this down at the end of the lesson. He's very thorough, isn't he? Look how he's cleaning everything up. Very good, Bob. Well done. Thank you. Off you go. 
<sighs> right, what are we doing now? Ah, another table, slightly wobbly this time. So we know what the substrate is and we know what the product is, but what about where it happens? Let's do another list of enzymes. Amylase works in the mouth, in your saliva in fact, and also in your small intestine. Huh. Protease, that's easy. That's found in your stomach. That's what your stomach is for. Peptidase, now surprisingly, that works in your small intestine. So those two partner enzymes work in different places. Lipase, that works in your small intestine too. So there you go. And uh, those are, oh, wait a minute. Ah, another enzyme, also in the small intestine. Well, look, go on, have a guess. What do you think maltase could possibly break down? Write it down. Let's see if you're right. Maltase, what does it sound like? All right, then, he's off again with the cleaning cloth while you write that down. And for extra points, can you guess what it gets broken down into? So we're going to have maltase. What's the substrate? What's the product? You'll be doing very, very well if you get this. All right, I think Bob's going to give you a solution now. OK, maltose. Ah, so maltase breaks down maltose, and it makes glucose. You can also see a bit of a pattern there for the naming of sugars. They always end in O-S-E. Maltose was the substrate. Glucose was the product. And you can see there, double rings goes to single rings. Glucose is what we call a monosaccharide. It's a single ring sugar. Simple as there is. Easiest to get inside cells. Oh, we're back with the enzyme again. And there's the active site. And it's a complementary shape. And so let's see now. little competition for you. Which of these A, B and C is it complementary to? This isn't too difficult. Hopefully you all got C because it's circles, right? In other words, enzymes only attack the thing that they are the right shape for. They are what we call specific, and that's yet another GCSE word I'd really like you to learn. Enzymes are specific to their substrate, which means we need different shaped enzymes for all the different substrates that we have. That means you have literally thousands of different enzymes in your cells and in your digestive system doing all sorts of different jobs. Oh no, I'm done with the animation. Let's try a bit of CGI. Now here's an enzyme working at 10 degrees centigrade. And it's mooching around pretty slowly, actually. Oh, this, I, I spent millions on this animation. Isn't that brilliant? Oh, another hand. And that enzyme there is moving very, very slowly indeed. Let's increase the temperature slightly. 20 degrees centigrade. Now, this could be better. The particles will be moving faster. The enzyme is moving faster. It's more likely to find a substrate. The reaction will actually go quicker because it can find the substrate more quickly. At 30 degrees centigrade, let's push the limits of CGI. Oh, Hollywood, eat your heart out. Look at that. Absolutely incredible. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. That's enough. Thank you. There we go. The enzyme was moving really fast, which means we can rank order them. 10 degrees centigrade, that counts as pretty slow. Then you've got medium for 20. And then at 30, you would say that the reaction was going fast. The rate of the reaction would be very fast. That's when it would be a good catalyst. You can even do an experiment. This is a classic in schools. Get some enzyme, run it at different temperatures, and there goes the independent variable along the bottom. Let's put the dependent variable up the side, speed, which we call rate, if we're being really proper. And what you'll get is some results that look a bit like this. Results, please, Bob. Thank you very much. Really fast, up there, and then, ah, a complete catastrophe. The enzyme absolutely stops working at high temperature. At that temperature there, for a human enzyme, that's what we call optimum. That's when it's going as fast as it possibly can. Down there, it's pretty slow. There, it's about medium. But here, there's been a disaster. There's been a real problem. Let's find out why. All right, we'll just let Bob clean that one off while you think about it for a little while. Oh, here's that enzyme again. And what we're going to do is we'll trace around the shape of the enzyme, please, Bob. Thank you. And what we can, we'll add some virtual heat. And what it does is it changes the shape of the enzyme. It makes it all deformed. I'm melting. I'm melting. Look at that. It's horrible. But it could get worse. It's getting worse. Now, that doesn't look anything like the original enzyme, does it? Look at that. No active site. 
it's no longer complementary. It can no longer work. What we say is that it's become denatured. Not killed. Do not say enzymes get killed. That's, that's just wrong. It can't go back to being the normal enzyme. It's become denatured. It's messed up forever. So that enzyme is now useless. It needs to be recycled back into amino acids by some functioning protease. What else can denature enzymes? Well, I'll tell you what. Acids can. For some enzymes, even neutral solutions can, and alkalis can. Here are some enzymes. And in each of these, the enzyme has got a functioning active site in only one pH condition. So there's one enzyme, and here comes another one. Can you tell where the functioning active site is? This is not a difficult quiz. In all of those pictures, only two of them have gone, like, there it is, there's one, and there's the other one. I'm sure you spotted it. Right, good. Well, where in your body would those be? Acid conditions. Do you have acid in your body? Of course you do. Where is it? Neutral conditions, well, think about your mouth. Does it feel burning at all? Right, OK. Well, Bob's got to go through all this cleaning business, and then he'll give us a solution. There. Stomach for acid. Mouth is neutral. And you do actually have an alkaline part of your body as well. It's your small intestine because of juices from the pancreas. Now let's find out which, en which enzymes actually like these conditions. Are there any acid-loving enzymes? Yes, there are. Protease, remember, in your stomach. Amylase, and then peptidase there for alkali, that's good. Or in lipase, and amylate, hang on, and maltase. There's a problem here. Can you see it? Can't be both right. Well, it turns out there are two different types of amylase in your body. Oh, let's have a look at a picture of a body. Now, at GCSE, you will never be expected to draw this diagram, but it's really quite handy for revision purposes if you can, and if you can label all the bits. And I'm hoping that in your head right now, you can sort of see where we're going with this. Bob's just labelling up the pancreas for you. Makes lipase, makes maltase, peptidase, and also pancreatic amylase. And that functions there in the small intestine. Right, what else have we got? Up the top there, not a very well-drawn mouth, but there's the saliva coming out of your salivary glands. It contains amylase. That's why bread tastes sweet if you chew it long enough. Also irritate your family. Right, and there is the stomach. It makes two things, protease and also hydrochloric acid, which is why the stomach has got such an acidic pH, such a low pH. Oh, this is an interesting organ. This is your liver. It makes a substance called bile. Bile is not actually an enzyme but it does help the lipase to do its job. And there again, it works in the small intestine. We're done. This is what I really want you to take away from watching this film. You need to be able to write down what you think all of these words might mean. Now, hopefully you've got enzyme. Hopefully product and substrate are pretty OK. Catalyze, active site, optimum, rate. It's so good if you can use these words properly in a GCSE exam. And then here are the enzymes themselves that you need to know. Learn them, learn what their substrates are, learn where they work, learn what pH they are like, and you will be an expert on enzymes. Thank you very, very much for watching, and I hope you do well in your GCSEs. Bye-bye now.